Fukushima Daiichi is a six-reactor nuclear power station on the east coast of Japan, 250 kilometers north of Tokyo, first commissioned in 1971. Reactors are uranium-powered fission boiling water reactors, except that Unit 3 is a mixed core with plutonium. Each of the six units has its own pool for spent rod assemblies, plus another common pool at ground level. On March 11, 2011, Units 1, 2 and 3 were in operation. Unit 4 was operational, but the reactor core had been unloaded for maintenance. Units 5 and 6 were both unloaded and in cold shutdown, ready for planned maintenance. The large 8.4 earthquake struck offshore from Fukushima on the afternoon of March 11, 2011. Within an hour, a very large tsunami wave reached Fukushima and breached the sea walls. Live coverage in the Sendai area, Miyagi Prefecture, north of Japan. For those of you who have just tuned in to NHK World, a major earthquake hit Japan Friday afternoon about an hour ago, hour and ten minutes ago. Japan's Meteorological Agency says the quake measured magnitude 8.4. It has agency has issued a tsunami warning for Japan's Pacific coast. In northeastern Japan's Iwata Prefecture, tsunami waves of over 4 meters were observed soon after the quake. The agency is warning that the tsunami could reach between 6 and 10 meters. Now would be a good time to pause the video and subscribe below. Please click on the bell symbol and that will give you notification when new videos come out. Thank you. Please subscribe. Fukushima Daiichi generally withstood the seismic earthquake well, but the tsunami flooded the power generators and backup generators. Reactors 1, 2 and 3 lost power and the reactor cores overheated and began boiling dry the fuel rods despite all efforts. Within a few days, reactors 1, 2 and 3 went into at least partial meltdown. And then melted through the base of the reactor containment vessels. Some of the fuel rod pools boiled low on water, exposing spent fuel rods. Units 1, 2 and 3 experienced spent rod pool fires. The situation was saved through pumping water from fire trucks over the pools, more than 100 tonnes per day. Over time there have been hydrogen explosions that have destroyed the top floors of Units 1, 3 and 4. There are a number of measures of radiation. Radiation as it impacts on humans is measured in sieverts or in millisieverts, which are one thousandth of a sievert. Radiation emitted from a radioactive source is measured in becquerels. Background radiation levels are generally less than five millisieverts. Symptoms may start above 50 millisieverts, but typically it is not until you get about 500 millisieverts that one starts to feel and see the effects such as nausea, fatigue or vomiting. Between 500 and 1000 millisieverts one might additionally expect hair loss, diarrhea. Anything over one sievert is very serious indeed, with death likely above four to five sieverts. At Hiroshima, almost all of those who had five sieverts of exposure 50% eventually died. With exposure levels above 5 sieverts, death is relatively rapid. At 10 sieverts, death is likely in 1 or 2 weeks. At 20 sieverts, death may be measured in hours or minutes. To provide some context, the level of radioactivity beneath each of the melted cores of units 1, 2 and 3 in 
February 2017 was measured at 530 sieverts per hour. So where is the radiation going? The first model of radiation dispersion that we'll look at is an atmospheric chemistry model. This shows that much of the airborne radiation moved rapidly east and northeast from Fukushima and airborne radiation would have reached Alaska, Canada and US West Coast within about 8 days. It is worth overlaying here the range and migration route of sockeye salmon. Let's just review that dispersion again. The second model is a sea-based model of dispersion. The NOAA model uses tracer materials placed in the water at Fukushima that was then traced by sea to reach the Hawaiian Islands within two years and to spread across the Pacific generally within five to six years. Cesium-137, one of the more common fission materials from uranium-235 reaction, has a relatively short half-life of 30 years and it has a high water solubility. The tracer invades the highly energetic Kuroshio regime within the first weeks after the release and starts spreading meridionally due to the eddies dominating the flow field in this area. After one year, maximum concentrations are diluted by two orders of magnitude and already cross the dateline, further heading east. The southern edge of the tracer cloud reaches the Hawaiian Islands after about two years, while the northern edge has begun to enter the Bering Sea. Meanwhile, concentrations near Japan have been dropping significantly due to replacement by less contaminated waters through the Kuroshio, separating the main cloud into a northern and a southern part. After four years, the maximum concentration has dropped by three orders of magnitude and the entire northern Pacific is filled with a certain amount of tracer. When the peak concentration reaches the North American coast after about five to six years, it has been diluted by four orders of magnitude. So what has been the impact on Alaska, Canada and West Coast USA and on the Pacific generally? There have been many videos from environmentalists and also professional full-time divers who say that the West Coast, Canada and USA has tra changed dramatically in recent years. Some of the Canadian areas were considered nurseries of the Pacific and are now bereft of life. There is a lot of sea life dying, but radiation is only one of the causes. Some of these other potential causes are lack of oxygen in the water, algae bloom, pollution, lack of food for the fish, and viral infections. Some of this is related to global warming and climate change and we must better understand the cause and effects here. However, there are many reportings of mutations which suggest radioactivity. Two thousand and sixteen was a disaster for the Alaskan salmon industry. In two separate fishery areas, the two thousand and sixteen harvest was down eighty five per cent in the previous five year average. On the eighteenth of january two thousand seventeen, the US Secretary of Commerce granted a declaration of disaster for the Alaskan pink salmon industry. It so happens two days before the secretary was stepped down from her position. So let's compare Fukushima with Chernobyl. Chernobyl was a single reactor, partial meltdown, but the radiation spewed upwards and across highly populated areas. Fukushima is indicating three total core meltdowns, so approximately nine times the radioactive power assuming the same size, etc. But the airborne radiation went out to sea at Fukushima and the radiation from the core meltdown 
went down into the ground and groundwater and thence to the sea. Also, the Japanese had learned from the Chernobyl experience and minimised population impact of radiation by quickly distributing iodine tablets and they stopped the sale of milk. There were approximately 20,000 deaths at Chernobyl but so far only three reported deaths at Fukushima all from accidents to workers at the site at the time of the tsunami. In December 2011, TEPCO officials declared that Fukushima Daiichi was now in cold shutdown state, meaning that the water was no longer boiling in the spent rod pools. This means that the rods themselves are relatively safe if they are not bumped or if there is no damaging hydrogen explosion or if there is no further earthquake. Since then, hydrogen gas built up from reactors 1 to 3 have caused explosions in 1, 3 and 4, taking the roofs off the structures, but without harming the rod pools. Up to 300 tonnes of water a day is still being used to cool fuel rods and to clean up the site. There are now more than 1,000 stainless steel tanks on site holding more than 1 million tonnes of radioactive water. These are bolted together, not welded. These are not small tanks. As recently as January 2017, there have been fires in Unit 4. While the fuel rod pools are now relatively stable, all of the radioactive material is now stored outside of the reactor containment vessels and is therefore more at risk of a further large earthquake. The reactor core containment vessels and base structure have been too radioactive to even measure. Robots were being fried in minutes before they could take measurements. In February 2017, measurements were finally achieved for Unit 2 below the containment vessel and radioactivity was estimated at 530 sieverts per hour. Nuclear scientists in announcing these levels themselves acknowledged that the radiation was at unimaginable levels. In Unit 2, the core meltdown has melted a 1 metre diameter hole in the grating below the reactor core vessel, indicating a full meltdown with likelihood of radioactive material going into the ground or groundwater. The Japanese have applied learnings from Chernobyl nuclear disaster and this has undoubtedly moderated the radiation impact on the human population in surrounding areas. We do know that it's going to take a very long time to clean up, a minimum 50 years, and now some are talking of several decades. That is a lot of time for further situations and accidents to occur on site. The melted cores from units 1, 2 and 3 are missing in action and are going to continue producing radioactive material into the foreseeable future. It will impact the environment in some way. It is not going to stop. It is not going to go away. The half-life of uranium-235 is 700 million years. It will take several years for the impact of radiation poisoning on humans and marine life to be seen and measured. At the moment it is an unknown quantity. There is significant potential for Fukushima Daiichi to be a major source of radiation contamination for many years to come. In short, the situation continues to be a slow-moving train wreck.